Oh yeah, that's right. We're back for another episode of the Amazing Outdoors Podcast. Really excited for today's episode. I've got a forester from northern Wisconsin, Bayfield County. We're going to talk forestry management and how that's helping out the sharp-tailed grouse in northwest Wisconsin. This is going to be episode 10. So enjoy the conversation with Mike and I. Information will be in the show notes. I'm not going to take up a bunch of time in this me uh, pre-recording show note kind of deal. I'm just going to get with it today. But keep an eye out. Sponsorship stuff's going to drop here within the next few days. And really excited to get Jason and Upland Outfitters on board. Well, I got Mike Aman. Did I say it right? Well, it's Amon. Amon. I, I knew I was going to mess it up, but well, I got Mike here. Mike's a Bayfield, the Bayfield, one of the Bayfield County Foresters. Mike, welcome to the Amazing Outdoors podcast. Uh, can you give us kind of an introduction or rundown? Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Brian. Um, yeah, like you said, I'm a Bayfield County Forester. Uh, I've been uh, with Bayfield County for 18 years, and it's. Uh, I love the area, and it's it's a large county forest, 176,000 acres. It's one of I think 30 county forests in the in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, county Forest Systems, the largest uh, public landowner in the state of Wisconsin. I think we're about 2.4 million acres, so a lot of a lot of forestry and a lot of uh, wildlife uh, are living on the county forest. So it, it's kind of a, a great uh, combination of uh, being a forester and and, and having wildlife, uh, you know, all around you. Yeah, that I'm kind of jealous of you guys sometimes, but I, uh, I don't know. You get to spend so much time outside for a career. It's, it's like I said, I'm slightly envious and jealous sometimes. <laughs> so how how'd you get into forestry? Yeah, uh, well, I grew up uh, down by Madison. Uh, my dad worked for the the Department of Natural Resources as a hydrogeologist, so he worked. Uh, for the state, uh, doing spill, toxic spill clinic cleanup, and and he uh, loved uh, hunting fish, and so I grew up, you know, appreciating the natural resources and getting an early introduction to uh, being outdoors, and and sort of like that environmental job that he had, sort of the awareness of just sort of natural resources and you know conservation, um, real you know real instrumental and in sort of like forming who I was in terms of appreciating those things and being outdoors a lot and hunting and fishing. And so, yeah, when I went to college, I didn't really have a, a real specific plan other than, geez, I, I think I want to work outside and I want to do something in the natural resources. And so I went to uh, UW-Madison and uh, initially it was going to be, I took some classes on forestry and wildlife and, and I took Forestry 100 and the professor, Ray Geary, was, I was just blown away and super interested. And I said, all right, I want to be a forester. I, I like this forestry business. And so yeah, I went to UW Madison, and um, and then actually sitting in one of the classes, one of the professors talked about county forests in Wisconsin. I had never heard of such a thing. I again, being from southern Wisconsin, didn't know anything about uh, the county forest system, and sort of stuck with me. I'm like, what is this county forest system? And and I graduated, and and I and I got an internship up here in Vilas County. I worked for uh, for for Vilas County Forest for as an intern for a while, and then I got a job over in. Burnett County Forest, and I worked there for a year and a half, enjoyed it uh, as the assistant administrator, and then in 2003, I applied and got the job up at Bayfield County, um, and really have been here ever since, and uh, you know, a lot of hunting, fishing, and being close to Lake Superior, and it's, it's uh, I love my job, you know, I'm outside quite a bit, good exercise, and uh, the work is rewarding. Uh, yeah, you can't, you can't 
beat Bayfield County. It's a, uh, it's a gem in Wisconsin, to be honest. Uh, my, uh, my folk, I grew up in Appleton and, um, our, our, we always vacationed up in door County and door County okay. got overrun. And <laughs> I mean, it just did it. You know, you can't, you can't even drive down town fish Creek anymore without going through a traffic jam. And, um, we moved out to the cities about a decade ago and we started going up to Northwest Wisconsin and it reminds me so much of door County because of the big Lake. But, uh, at the same time, there's near, not nearly the amount of Illinois plates, nothing against the folks from Illinois, but, um, <laughs> you know, it gets jammed heavily, heavily in door County. So I really, yep. I really like Bayfield County. I, I love that whole, uh, Apostle Islands area, which I think is Ashland County, but, um, yeah, the, the whole, that whole, I think it's two counties there that, uh, border Lake Superior, I think is some of the most beautiful parts of Wisconsin. So very much so. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, you know, we got connected when I came up to the Wisconsin sharp tail grouse society, um, looking to kind of do a story on sharp tail grouse. And I kind of, to me, you know, I, I didn't expect there to be such a hand in hand relationship with County forestry with some, a bird that most people I think associate with the prairie. So can you, can you give us a, you know, a little bit of information about why County forestry would be concerned with prairie grouse? Sure. Yeah. There, there's a, the, the historic rain. Well, the Northwest sands is, is in Northwest Wisconsin and historically it was an open landscape. Sharp tails were very common, and then um, you know reforestation and settlement and the, the, the sharp tail habitat definitely degraded. But a lot of those that historic area is public and private, but a lot of county forests um, are in the Northwest Sands, and so there's been enough remnant openings and whatnot through management uh, that we've held on to some sharp tails, and the habitat just been good enough, just good, barely good enough to hold some some birds here and there. And then and, and there's some state properties that are more dedicated to, to, to open landscape, barren habitat, and they're sort of uh, anchor points for, for sharp-tailed grouse populations. And, and the county forest system has been supportive of and recognizing sort of the, that, that tension between forested production timber and the wildlife that historically was here that was dependent on more open landscapes. And so there's been sort of a long relationship, I think, between Burnett County, Douglas County, Bayfield County, where there's going to be, you know, how can we accommodate both? And so I think, you know, there there is a capacity that, to, to find that balance. And, and so historically, there, there's been some sharp tails that have sort of hung on on the various county properties. And some of those county properties are, are managed to be open. So there's definitely, um, you know, counties are, Douglas County has county forest that's maintained open. And, and we, we have that too. So I, I think it's... Uh, we acknowledge that there's wildlife that needs special, you know, special, you know, concern to, to, to hold on to their population. And so I think they've been around, we've had them, and I think it's our responsibility to sort of figure out how we can keep them around uh, without losing that population. It's a small population and they are a creature of the open landscape. So there's definitely a struggle with the county forest mission in some respects to to make, basically maximize timber, but we also have a responsibility to, to uh, look at the wildlife and, and figure out how we can kind of achieve that balance. So I think the county forests are aware of the sharp-tailed grouse, and I, and I know in Bayfield County, um, we've had the birds, and with the, with the help with the DNR, we've, we've, we've tried to develop a plan in the last, well, it's probably been around 15, 20 years where we had a plan where we had these shifting mosaics to try and have young harvest adjacent to permanent openings to accommodate uh, some of those wildlife species that, that, that need barrens and open habitat. And so over time, you know, we did that for a number of years and then we sort of came up with a new plan that we hope is a little better than what we had before. And so we're in the process of rolling out um, the rolling barrens and, and, and what that is is a 11,000 acre project area. And, and in the center will be a circle of a thousand acres that will keep as permanent core, permanently open, burned on a regular basis. And then adjacent to that, we're going to have four zones and we're going to try and uh, take and, and have management that sort of extends the reach of that core to provide complementary habitat to the core for the sharp tails. Because the sharp tails will interact with young forests 
And so we want to, you know, plan in such a way where we can achieve working forest lands and achieve good shark tail habitat. And so with uh, Bob Hansen with the Wisconsin DNR and, and there's a Northwest Corridor plan, there's some other plans in place that sort of are, are being developed to sort of how can we, you know, connect these populations and, and have high quality habitat. And the Bayfield County Forest wants to be part of that conversation. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, we, we need all the players in part, you know, county, local, state, feds, private. It's a concerted effort on almost all of these kind of, kind of habitat challenges that we face across all of the native bird species, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We're one piece of the, the pie. You're right. We have to work across these landscapes. And, you know, there's a lot of challenges we have. Of course, we've always had challenges, but we have opportunities. And I think good communication and, and just recognizing the value of these, it, you know, helps us all sort of work together. So I think there's, there's a lot of good momentum here behind the, the sharp tail grouse here. Uh, now and I mean it's kind of ebbed and flowed and, and hopefully we can sort of get that momentum going and keep it going and and you know turn the tide a little bit on some of the shark tail concerns that are ha- you know we have right now. Well, I'll definitely tell you I really hope that uh, the Amazing Outdoors podcast can be responsible for driving <laughs> a few lis- <laughs> listeners to the group uh, because I, I, yes. I, I just awareness and, and making making awareness and then driving support for this is really my end goal with this podcast on, uh, especially in this particular topic. So, um, yeah, well, I appreciate you shedding some light on the topic. This is important. So yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy you're doing this. I, I appreciate it. So with, you know, your management in Bayfield County, um, I think some of the listeners may not understand and, and we did get into it with Bob Hansen, and I'm going to be rolling these episodes out very close in, in, in um, uh, timeline to each other. So with, with the Barron's landscape, what, how much of the Barron's landscape makes up Bayfield County? And how does your forest management plan kind of differ between the two landscapes? You know, the Barron's is a specific, unique landscape, and I'm kind of curious how much of it makes up the, the county. Sure, a tiny fraction of a of one percent. I mean, this is sort of the issue. I mean, we have a thousand acres of one hundred and seventy six thousand acres in the county forest. A thousand acres is what we're maintaining, basically, as permanent uh, open barren habitat. So that is very small. Of course, the, uh, there's some caveats to that. Uh, and our entire forest doesn't fall in the northwest sands, which wouldn't necessarily be ideal sharp tail habitat. But it is a very small percentage of the total that we're dedicating to sharp tails specifically. But again, there's a lot of young forest, you know, that zero to 10 year age class or 15 year age class is good sharp tail habitat. So that would be sort of in line with the classic barren sort of uh, nature of barren, the sort of shrubland, young forest, grassland combination. So in any given year, we may have thousands of acres that would maybe meet the threshold of what we would call open sort of barren habitat in the first 10 or 15 years of a, of a jack pine clear cut and the reforestation efforts. So in terms of like permanent openings, it's a thousand acres. And, and then, uh, and the young forest that's in that area is, uh, you know, thousands of acres probably at any given time. I will say we are adding to that permanent core. So it's a thousand acres and then we're actually adding new barrens because we're based on the advice with the DNR. We want to connect uh, our population to uh, adjacent populations. And so the county is actually investing in opening up another 1300 acres to add to that thousand acres. It's still in development and we're, we're in, we're, we're still clearing those acres. So, you know, we're adding acres and we think those will be strategic openings. And so it's in, in part of our our 15 year plan that we've just developed, which sort of guides the, the county forest system. Every county forest has to have a land management plan that's renewed every 15 years and sort of updated. And part of our update process included um, uh, this additional barren uh, management. And so. It, it, it's in the plan and we're following through and based on the advice of, 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 of the DNR and other plans that exist that we think this would be a strategic addition. So, yeah, I think there has to be a good explanation to start taking to take working forest lands out of production and put them in barrens. And it, it's a small, 
small percentage of the total, but, you know, we have to sort of explain to our, our taxpayers in Bayfield County. I mean, we generate a lot of revenue for the county through working forest land that we're going to take those acres out of production, but we need to explain why that's important to those same citizens and to the landscape and our responsibilities as land managers. You know, it makes perfect sense. And yeah, it is, um, that, that's why I asked because, you know, typically, um, the Barron's landscape is, is very well tied to kind of that, that Northwest sands. And I, I knew that just a small portion of really that landscape fell in, in uh, Bayfield County. So when you look at managing just the, the Barron's land, because you worked in Burnett County, so I'm going to ask you a little question. Hopefully you might be able to answer, but there's a different timber makeup that makes up the Barron's sands than what you typically see in the what the rest of kind of Bayfield County, correct? I mean, we're, you get different, the plot. Yeah. There's different yep. uh, tree species that, that flourish in that versus in kind of some of the more wet traditional forests that we see up in Northwest. Yes. Yeah, correct. Yeah. It's uh, the, the Northwest sands is, is sandy droughty soils. And we see a lot of, I mean, historically jack pine, red pine, you know, scrub oak, you know, poor quality oak and aspen. Uh, some birch, but primarily pine, jack pine, and we planted a lot of red pine. And then other parts of the county forests that are off the northwest sands uh, would be, you know, northern typical northern hardwood sands. Um, you know, we have oak stands, but yeah, it's it's sandier, so it's, there's generally more pine that's present. So when you when you when you develop a management plan, it it that that's kind of the timber industry that you're going after is is the the people that are looking to harvest pine trees. Yeah, correct. Yeah, perfect. That's kind of what I was looking for because typically, you know, up north, you, most people I think think of either, you know, pine trees, but a lot of people think of you know maple, oak, and and just kind of aspen and popple stands, more more pulp wood, kind of. Um, it, at least that's the impression I've always had when I thought about up north. So your your management plan with the the sandy soil and and the jack pine is is much different than managing an aspen cut. Sure. Yep. That's yep. Correct. So with that, um, that kind of play, uh, we, we talked a little bit about fire, um, because of the sands makeup, because of the more arid nature of, of the landscape, fire plays in a sig- significant role in managing lands for these sharp tails in Wisconsin. How, how does that, you know, the management plan differ with the fire pres- prescribed fire, um, and, and, and your goals for, for timber harvesting? Um, what's a the role there and, and kind of how does that all play out? Yeah, good question. We, uh, a fire prone landscape, uh, a lot of concern about wildfire and, uh, you know, on the, on, on working timber lands, uh, there is, you know, we don't want wildfires obviously, and we do not, um, we do not do much prescribed burning except in that core, we are burning, burning our, our core area and and the, as it relates to um succession and working forest lands we're, we're sort of mimicking instead of having a fire we're having a clear cut and then we're going through and doing the reforestation efforts so we're getting sort of that young forest and that rejuvenation and starting a forest over instead of using fire we're just using uh harvesting to sort of mimic the natural disturbance disturbance regime that is uh, you know historically occurred uh, pre, uh, logging and pre forestry. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it, you know, with the arid landscape, you know, one, one lightning strike and all of a sudden now you got a big forest fire and that's very counterintuitive to, uh, industrial foresting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't play well together. And that's where the Nemecog and Barrens, the Prex Meadows is a big dedicated Muckwa Barrens. That's a huge landscape up in the, up in the peninsula of Bayfield County. Gosh, I don't even know if that's, nine or 10,000 acres is is huge. And so that's, you know, again, dedicated fire is on the landscape and there's a lot of benefits to having fire on the landscape. It's just sort of hard to do both when you're looking at, you know, working forest lands and then having fire in those same, you know, areas, you sort of have to pick where you're going to put the fire on the landscape and it's good to have it, but you know, where we can't, we, we try and mimic it through timber harvest. Makes sense. Um, So with that, you kind of touched on, that Bayfield County had a, a 15 year plan. And in my conversations with Bob Hansen, he's going to be responsible for 
making a 10-year plan for the, the Wisconsin DNR for sharp tails. H- how are those two plans kind of working together, potentially? Sure. Yep. Yeah, I would say the our plan being uh, finalized, and, and they're just getting their 10-year plan, I think, hopefully going here. I think it's up for renewal here soon. Yeah, he's, he, uh, Bob said he's going to hopefully start working on it soon, hopefully. Yeah, and I think, you know, as part of that plan, it's sort of built on all these other things that are sort of happening on the landscape. And so, you know, I think having our plan and our, our, our development of the new barons will be, you know, fundamental in sort of, you know, going into that plan to say, hey, these are the efforts that are, are, are happening now and into the future. And so, you know, this is the outlook. This is maybe some of the, you know, uh, ways we can see the, the population potentially improve. And so, yeah, I, I just think we're, we're going to be just adding some information to that 10-year plan that's going to be updated because we'll have more acres. And even our, our existing rolling barrens project is, is new enough that it's, it's not probably built into the, the DNR plan. And, and some of the DNR plan, that, that, that'll be sort of just larger scale, you know, what's the sharp tail population, what are the needs, where are the concerns, and, you know, and, and, and so there'll be some overlap for sure. I think some of our management and our plan will inform the 10-year plan. I know that you, 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 there's been some challenges with, you know, I guess let me step back for a second. Being, being in the forestry management industry, you deal with a lot of not, you know, the Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society, as well as the DNR, as well as, you know, probably uh, hand in hand a little bit on some federal lands as well up there. Um, I know that there's some vacancies at the DNR, and I know that the Wisconsin sharp tailed grouse had some concerns. How, how do you, do you see there potentially some issues coming up in the next few years with this 10 year plan coming out and some of the vacancies and kind of sign offs that you need from crews at the Wisconsin DNR that those positions just aren't filled right now. Oh yeah, it is. It is an issue. I mean, we, as the County forest system, we rely on a lot you, of, deep- I'm going to cut you off real quick and, and, and say that it's probably a single podcast issue alone, but I, yeah, you know, if, yeah. you, if you can highlight it again, this is about shedding a light on, on some, on these birds and then some of the challenges that we face. So yeah, if you could yep. kind of maybe shed a light on that with the DNR and, you know, not, uh, I like Bob Hansen a lot and I don't want to make him sound like he, you know, it's, it's his problem, but maybe explain to the listeners a little bit what, what really is the problem. Uh, yeah, the problem is with the vacancies, there is, they're just not enough capacity to, 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 to do some of the work. And so Bob Hansen needs, support from a vacant position which is the upland game ecologist which isn't filled and so it, he, his, his plate is full and so to write the plan you need capacity and, and the plan is really important if the plan doesn't get done you know then then we're sort of our management and our goals are sort of uh, waiting for that plan to sort of flesh out what the future looks like and, and there's a vacancy here in Bayfield County and Ashland County a, a wildlife biologist that the position vacant and that position part of that position is to do spring surveys on the sharp tails in Bayfield County and keep an eye on the local population. And when we don't have the in our staff, they're not, give, they're not maintaining the long-term baseline data of what the population is doing. So that helps inform future management is how is the population doing currently? And when you don't have dedicated field staff in place, uh, you, you don't get that information. And so, those vacancies are just hanging up just some of the basics, you know, inventory and developing the new plan, which are critical. Yeah. It, 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 it really stops some progress there. Um, sounds like I, I, I don't, there's a few groups that have voiced their concern and I think we all would like to get things done and it's not, uh, it's a little frustrating sometimes when simple things can't get done. So the bigger project can't move forward. Yeah, absolutely. So can you speak a little bit to the need for, you know, your 15 year plan and the county's 15 year plan, the 10 year plan that maybe is currently out and then, you know, the new one that's going to be updated. But the big issue is kind of connecting these almost islands of habitat that are currently in existence that have remnant populations of sharp tails and what the real big goal is for this effort? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you, you got it. There's what, what we're left with is sort of birds stranded in isolated pockets of, of, of decent habitat. Not ideal, but they're sort of remnant populations, and we call those subpopulations. And and genetically, and just you know, the vigor of, of those small populations, so dependent on you know that that postage stamp habitat, makes them really vulnerable. Um, and so, the goal of the the Northwest Corridor Plan, the Sharp Tail Management Plan, our 15 year plan, is to connect these landscapes to make those populations more robust. We want uh, connection of these populations. If they can, you know, get from Bayfield County Forest onto the private lands to the north of us where there's some birds and then they can connect with Mukwa, they can have, you know, genetic exchange and they can uh, connect habitats that should provide resilience to the, to the shark tails in general and, and put them on more solid foundation. You know, if they can connect, if we can connect hands, landscapes effectively, the population should be a little more stable. And then maybe we could turn the tide and actually increase populations a little bit by having that sort of connection in place. And, and I don't know if you want me to talk about this, you know, uh, the sharp tail grouse research project that sort of that we're doing now to sort of yeah, help you, answer some of those yeah, if you, questions. If you want to go in, go into a little bit of that, you know, I, I, I kind of the next topic we have coming up is, is the Wisconsin, Wisconsin sharp tail grouse society and kind of the players involved in some of this. So I think that's a good segue to maybe uh, talk a little bit about the research project. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Great. This is really exciting for sharp tail work. I don't know. Bayfield County has embarked on a project to uh, get a better handle on the, the sharp tails that live on the Bayfield County forest. And uh, how do we do that? Well, we are pursuing GPS collars and we are we partnered with the University of Minnesota Natural Resources Research Institute, the Avian Ecology Lab, to kind of develop a, a project to analyze life cycle analysis, what's productivity of the birds, uh, uh, movement data, habitat use, basically baseline data. What are these birds doing day in, day out? How are they moving across the landscape? And I think we just don't know that information now. So in order to sort of have a good plan or, or be effective and efficient with your habitat management, we, we just need some of that information answered. And with these new, uh, these collars, these GPS collars, they should give us, we're, we're hoping, really good data. Uh, to, to see how these birds are, are, are moving across the landscape. And so we're in a process of trying to collar, well, maybe 15, 20 birds total. Uh, and, what, and what we're trying to do is, is do them on different locations in Bayfield County and Douglas County, uh, these subpopulations that get a handle on their individual movement and then just sort of build over time, uh, over a couple few years, at least sort of this data set that shows they're moving here, they're not moving there. And they're using this type of habitat and they're not using that type of habitat. So, you know, landscape connectivity, it sort of all plays into that. How are they going to, how are we going to connect these landscapes? Well, let's get some information about the birds and then we can uh, modify management to maybe accommodate that, mo that movement. Yeah. It's really, and so that, I, I, you know, being up and a little bit involved with the sharp tail grouse society in Wisconsin, I was privileged to some of the data that, um, came off of one of those birds. And I don't know that I shared this with you. Um, I think I shared it with a few of the other members, but my previous career, I was uh, involved in electronics manufacturing and I got to see a lot of that type of technology and the telemetry behind it. Um, I, I worked on a lot of projects in the industrial space and not so much in, in, in the, in the bird space, so I, I know the potential behind what kind of data it can you can get from these types of collars or, or these types of uh, GPS tracking units, and I, I was I was really excited to see that because I, I truly believe that data really is so important in a lot of these efforts. If you have the right data, you can make the right decisions. Um, going back in history, you know the, these birds were banded with a like a color band and a date code on it so your, your ability to actually track these things were almost virtually limited and then radio frequency collars kind of came in but you know they're you're still using you still have to have somebody out on site you still have to drive around you still have to use a uh, antenna to try to locate the pings of these birds and so the the data just isn't complete it's not it's the you know you've got data now on these birds potentially 
how, you know, you can get a ping uh, and, and GPS location off these birds, you know, down to the hour if you guys wanted to burn through a battery or something like that. We don't need to get in the technical electronics aspect of it. But the data capability is there to find out more and pattern these birds and find out exactly what they're using, exactly where they're spending most of their time and how that correlates to the habitat work that you guys are doing. It, it, to me, it, it, it is, I think, really going to help long-term make the right decisions now so we can impact and, and potentially have a hunting season on these birds again in the future. Yeah, it's exciting. And I, and I just want to back up a little bit and say that uh, who's funding it and being part of it, it it's definitely a partnership. Uh, it's Bayfield County is really yeah, sort and, of and the real impetus. Quick too, uh, Mike, if, if any of the listeners you know, could donate to the cause too, please highlight that and, and, and as you're kind of going through the partners. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the first off, uh, Bayfield County Forest gets some wildlife money from the DNR every year called nickel and acre money. And we can use that for wildlife purposes. And so we've kind of uh, accumulated some some of that money and we sort of had this idea to sort of like, well, let's monitor the birds on, on the Bayfield County Forest. And that, pop, and that project grew to sort of look across uh, the landscape and not just Bayfield County. And we, again, partnered with the Natural Resources Research Institute and they, they came up with a, a good chunk of money too. So Bayfield County and our I came up with a, a, a good chunk of money and the sharp Grouse Society donated uh, some money for for a collar which was really appreciated and really you know really shows their commitment to to this research project and, and i think the best way to for listeners or support folks that want to support the effort i think uh, going on the wisconsin sharp grouse society website and 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 donating there and, and maybe making a note hey we would like to see see these dollars get used in this research project because i think it's sort of foundational and fundamental and really important to, to keep this project funded and moving forward yeah, and I'll definitely include all. Um, they, they they've got a Facebook page, they've got a website, um, Wisconsin Sharp Hail Grouse Society. So I'll, I'll make sure to include all of that information in the show notes, and so they can have a link. And if they want to donate to the cause and become a member. It'll all be in there. Um, so speaking of that, uh, you know, you're a, you're a board member for the Wisconsin Sharp Hail Grouse Society. Can you tell us a little bit about who they are and um, you know what memberships and donations and what that partnership means to Bayfield County and, and the Wisconsin DNR really. Yeah, sure. I'm fairly new to being on the board. And when I worked in Burnett County, which a lot of short tail habitat is there and in up here, I've, I've been aware that they've been around. Um, and now that I'm a new board member, I'm getting to know the, the society better. And I'm just, we are so fortunate to have, it's a small, dedicated group, but I will say they're mostly retired DNR folks that are very familiar with the bird, very passionate about the bird. And I, I just, it's really cool to go to these board meetings and listen just to the knowledge that these folks have about the bird. I mean, super fortunate to have uh, just the intellectual knowledge of sharp tails and habitat use. I mean, in terms of conservation organizations, they are really in the know at an intimate level of, of what these birds need. And, and then just, you know, the limited funds they have, they are really good about this money needs to go out the door and needs to go to habitat. And, and, and it's all about habitat. I mean, research is important, but habitat really, we sort of know like the limiting factor is habitat and, and researcher will inform the habitat, but that they do a really good job of using their limited funds wisely to put it out to the Forest Service, to the DNR, to the, the private lands, to the county lands. You, you apply for these funds, and uh, and, and they 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 they, swing, they they punch above their weight quite a bit in terms of being effective with their money. So, yeah, I'm happy to be uh, be on the board, um, and just you know looking forward to sort of you know putting my passion in there and uh, you know making habitat and, and keeping them updated and being part of you know the solution for the Sharpfield Growth Society. Yeah, I, I, I had the pleasure, and that's where we met. Um, I think it's Dave, who's the uh, the president right now. Um, yep. I, uh, I reached out to him kind of as a part of this whole effort to try to create a little bit of awareness and shine a light on the sharp tails in Wisconsin and try to get, you know, some interviews with some legitimate people that knew way more than I did. And he was so kind to me and invited me up to the board meeting and 
the first thing I, I thought when I got there was the knowledge base, the number of years of comp of, of compounded knowledge sitting around in it, it was pretty impressive. I, I wouldn't, I bet you there's over 500 years of knowledge yeah. combined. Yeah, I, 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 and I'm not joking. Um, yep. it, it's really neat to see that, um, those gentlemen who came out of retirement working with, you know, the DNR or, or working specifically with those birds and then retire and go right back into working with those birds for, you know, most of their retirement. And I guess I do have one comment and it is really for the listeners, not, not any, um, um, not a, you know, comment to the sharp tail grouse society, but, you know, we need some younger people involved in this conservation effort across the board through all conservation programs. I mean, you, you, you pheasants forever and, and, um, rough grouse society, you know, they've been kind of a cornerstone in, in this effort for, um, healthy forest and healthy grasslands. And, and they've done kind of a really good effort in getting younger people involved in their organization. When it comes down to like the chapter level stuff, I find that there is a lot of older generation people that are really putting an effort in so that us younger people have an opportunity in the future to take part in the recreating opportunities that we love to do. And I, I'm just kind of a call to action for all the listeners. Like, you know, it's, it's one thing to be a member, but try to get involved because there's a lot of knowledge out there that you can learn from other people. And it, it's, it's an opportunity that most people I don't think know exists or can't correlate at this point in their life if they're under 40 almost. And it's, we're, <laughs> we're, we're all busy. We all have got kids, dogs, yep. life, a job, trying to make an advancement in our career. But it, I, I just can't say enough that I think, you know, there's some young blood and you know, you're young. I, I think Trevor's he's, he was a little younger than me. So it was nice to see some younger people getting involved, but I, I, I can't say enough. We need more younger people involved in this conservation effort because it, it, it it's going to be a major team effort to improve the landscape. So these birds have a, you know, not just sharp tails, but all birds have a fighting chance as you know, the, the world and gets bigger and, we start to develop more of these spaces. So it's going to be a big concerted effort. And uh, I was really impressed with what the Wisconsin sharp tail grouse society did. I actually looked at kind of some of the budget and stuff that was out there and um, made the conscious decision that I'm going to become a lifetime member because they were really responsible with their money in comparison to some other organizations. And I felt that my, my dollars were going to go directly to habitat. So, um, yeah, that's just my little speech for, or, uh, speech for the Wisconsin Sharp-Tailed Grouse Society. So, um, you know, besides joining, say, that group, um, what can listeners do to support uh, these birds? I think talk about them. I think, you know, uh, be aware that they exist. And I think uh, come visit the area. I think there's Cretsmith, there's the Nemecogna Barrens, and I, I – you know, I don't have a real good answer on that because it is sort of a small population. And, and join, I mean, other than joining the Sharp Tail Grouse Society, but I think if there's an opportunity to to witness the birds dancing, it, it'll change your life. I mean, Brian, am I correct? It, 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 when you you watch these birds dance, it is sort of a very special thing to see in the state of Wisconsin. And I think sort of coming to the landscape, getting to know the area, it's it's a it's a different landscape, but it's it's really a there's a lot of appeal to having sharp tails on the landscape. And I think just being aware that they're here and advocating for it and the type of management, I mean, it's an intense management to keep landscapes open. And so the, the state and the feds and the county need support to sort of like keep investing in these birds. And these birds are only representing, you know, there's a lot of other wildlife benefits to having barrens. Uh, I mean, sharp tails are very important, but if you have sharp tails, you have a, a number of other w important wildlife species, Kirkland warbler, uh, you know, golden wing warbler. There's just a, there's a whole list of species. So this is bigger than sharp tails, but I think just sort of listening to the podcast and talking about it and uh, learning more about it in any way you can is, is just and being an advocate for it. I much agree. I got my my little uh, dog in here, and she she keeps hearing birds, 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 and. She's over here <laughs> wagging her tail. Are we going hunting today? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 when I 
finally, I mean, I, I started upland bird hunting myself really intensely about six years ago. Um, I, that was when I got my first dog and we didn't, we had dogs or raising uh, when I was raised as a boy, but, uh, they weren't hunting dogs. And, you know, my folks, they, my dad deer hunted and walleye fished and that that's what he did for a number of years. And he got into salmon fishing after that, but you know, he, he never really did much bird hunting. And so I was exposed to it later in life through a dog. And I shot my first sharp tail in North Dakota, I think it about six years ago. And then my first prairie chicken a couple of years ago in Kansas. And I kind of had this epiphany between, you know, delineating the native bird species and the non-native species. <laughs> and, uh, I, I just fell in love with the, the sharp tail story because I, I, I it's like a, it's an underdog story, absolute underdog story of Northwest Wisconsin. And these birds are, they're hardy uh, for, it's just amazing that we still have them here. And I, I wanted to personally do something about it. And uh, that's kind of why I reached out to all you guys. So I, I hope the listeners enjoy some of the, the, the conversation about these birds. And I hope that we can drive some action and, uh, you know, find out a little bit more about how we keep these birds on the landscape and, and get them to a point where, you know, people have an opportunity to go out and view the lack. And back to your point about the lack, <laughs> it is a life-changing experience. <laughs> it was the yeah. most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. I was in that yeah. blind from five ten in the morning until just before 10. And I had sh not dancing the whole time, but I had sharp tail grouse coming in and out of that lack the whole time. I, I it felt like five minutes. I'm like, yeah. I, all of a sudden they kind of, I'm not sure what came through or if they were just done for the day or, you know, I, I had kind of started to pack a few things up, but I didn't even make any noise. And all of a sudden I look and, you know, they, they had all kind of busted out and, um, but it, you know, it was almost 10 o'clock. So I'm not really sure what they do after the morning kind of dancing routine. I don't know the whole biology behind it, but that time frame went by so fast and I remember just wanting more <laughs> and I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a hunter, you know, and, and here I'm going out with a camera and a, a microphone, you know, it, it was the coolest experience. And I, 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 people, if every person that had even cared about any kind of bird went and experienced that live, I truly think that you guys would have more money than you'd know what to do with. <laughs> I, I agree. It is such a unique experience that you can't leave that lack uh, and, and not feel fired up about, you know, uh, the habitat and the birds and how fortunate we are to still have them around. Exactly. So before we kind of, I, I ask you the next question, I'm going to slide one in and just make sure you have, said what you think you needed to say here today about the sharp tail grouse from the Wisconsin sharp tail grouse society standpoint and the Bayfield County standpoint. Yeah, I think we covered it extremely well. I think uh, there's a lot of good momentum uh, happening and I, I think there's going to be more to come. So I think, you know, we're in good communication with our partners and the habitat work is, I think is improving. And uh, yeah, I think, I think listeners should probably, you know, have gotten a pretty good backstory of where we're at in, for shark tails in Wisconsin as it relates to Bayfield County and working forest lands. Awesome. Well, I think uh, as Bob develops his plan and that rolls out, I, I, I think I should get you and Bob on and, and we should chat about what's coming up with how those plans are going to look over the next couple of years once uh, the DNR decides to uh, publish that plan. I think it would be fun to to talk about. So, yeah. And just one more thing, this research, I think, you know, every week we get more information and once we get six months, a year or two years in, I think just, uh, yeah, follow up. You know, we're learning a lot, uh, every day and it's only going to get better. So I think the future is really bright for, uh, you know, uh, shark tails. Yeah. In Wisconsin. And, well, and, and just so you know, I personally would like to volunteer if you guys need any help with some of that stuff. I, I, after experiencing that, that dancing on the lack uh, last, uh, yeah, last, geez, last, last Saturday. Um, I, I just want to give my time. I, I just want to be involved. I, I, I want to be able to do that again sometime in the future. And, um, I'd love to see more birds out there. So, yep. um, so 
we didn't really get into hunting, any hunting chat. Um, I, huh. I, 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 we talked a little bit before, but, uh, I know you're kind of a nut just like I am. How, how, how'd you do last season for grouse hunting up North? I uh, I did good. I, I, I feel like I'm cheating because, uh, I work on a forest where I set up a lot of Aspen. We have a lot of Aspen and I'm not going to tell you which County I'm in. Hopefully everybody forgot. There's no birds in, uh, what am I in Bayfield County? Yeah. Uh, as a forester, I get to set up the habitat and watch these, uh, these, these areas develop. And, and frankly, as a forester, I get to sort of, I'm really passionate about rough grouse. Uh, and I did, uh, well last year and I, I, it's fun to sort of set up these timber sales and, and go back in eight to 10 years and, and go, go hard, you know, go do some hunting in those, in those areas. And so I, I'm pretty consistent. I would say I'm, I'm usually able to find decent uh, bird numbers. And last year was better than the I'm, year before. And I'm going to say I hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, yeah. honestly, you are the guy that we all kind of thank. Um, or, well, at least in our heads, when we go harvest a few grouse in, in the county forest in a, in a great stand of Aspen. So, yeah. Yeah, we got out a lot. Uh, and, uh, we, uh, I, I can talk about my dogs now if you, if, if you want to hear that. But, yeah, I, I do a lot of hunting in Bayfield County and northwest Wisconsin in general for rough grouse and woodcock. Well, we always like to and, hear about uh, dogs. So yeah, yeah, I I've had some Weimariners actually. Were the, the 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 dog that my wife I met my wife she had a Weimariner didn't even know what a Weimariner was. I didn't grow up with hunting dogs. You definitely and, don't and see too stuff. many Weimariners in in the Northwoods. No, you don't, and that that's what made it so cool to have uh, the, the the her Weimariner our Weimariner when I I met her he was only a couple years old. And he, you know, he ended up being an excellent bird dog. And I was just, you know, we hunted a lot and uh, had just, I, I got hooked. You know, he was, he was a good pointing dog, good dog overall. And so I got hooked on rough girls and he used to be a big bow hunter. And then I met her and she had this dog and I took him out hunting. I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm hooked on rough grouse hunting. Because growing up, I, we didn't have a dog and we would chase them up, walk them up. And you hardly ever hit a bird. You never even knew if it was going to, you know, when it was going to flush or what whatnot and so and then when i got a bird dog it, it changed everything so i've, I've had uh, a number of weimariners over the years and uh it, it's been kind of fun repping the weimariner uh, breed in the upland hunting world because it is pretty rare and and they, they have sort of a a past where you know the, the breeding standards weren't the best so it is sort of hard to find a high quality weimariner but they're out there and, and i've been fortunate to have a few and i did i did switch it up a little bit i do have an english setter that just turned one, uh, a Llewellyn setter. And, uh, and he had a great first year and, uh, really excited for him to develop. He is, uh, yeah, he's just really good on grouse already. So I'm looking to, looking forward to, uh, many years ahead, uh, rough grouse hunting with the populations in Northwest, Northern Wisconsin. I mean, these county forest lands provide a lot of grouse habitat and, and the future looks bright for, you know, uh, Aspen and management and, and, uh, the Aspen Acres, at least up here, rough grouse are struggling nationwide and even in Wisconsin. But we're sort of the stronghold here in northern Wisconsin. We hope to keep it that way. Yeah, I was. Uh, um, I've talked to a number of different biologists, and the I think the reason that you know we're less affected by some of the the, the rough grouse issues that kind of um, encompass some of the other habitat ranges in other states that are just they just don't have the vast amount of habitat that we have here in northern Wisconsin or northern Minnesota. And if you have the right habitat, these types of issues that face, you know, like West Nile, for instance, um, it just doesn't affect our population in the drastic swings that you might see in like Pennsylvania um, because we have the habitat and the habitat gives those birds the opportunity to fend off some of these things. Absolutely. And I, and I will say a strong forest product industry is sort of critical in keeping these Aspen stands well managed. So we're really fortunate to have the acres, the amount of working forest lands, and then having the markets and mills that are able to, to, to take this wood. So there's a lot of things in our favor to, that provides resiliency to the rough grouse here in Woodcock and in, in, in Wisconsin and northern Wisconsin specifically. So we got a couple minutes left. 
you're in the best grouse country and their best grouse cover in the whole country. I think personally, you know, nothing against Minnesota or Michigan, but, um, I'm a Wisconsin boy living in Minnesota right now. And I still drive to Northern Wisconsin to hunt. So, (laughs) (laughs) um, what, uh, you got any other big plans for the fall? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I've been starting over the last few years. I've been, I've been venturing out West a little bit more. I have a, a network, a group of friends and, and they, some of them have been hunting, uh, pheasants and shark kales and prairie chickens and whatnot out West. And I hadn't really been doing that. I've done a couple of pheasant hunts over the years, but eh, it kind of, it was okay. Uh, but then we got into hunting shark tails. Uh, I took a trip a couple of years ago to North Dakota hunting sharp tails and I just loved it. I mean, just the landscape, just it's so much different than uh, the, the forested landscape and just especially early season rough grouse hunting is sort of a, a challenge with the heat and just the, everything's so green. It was just nice to sort of stretch your legs, let the dog run and have pretty easy walking and good dog work and uh, just shooting a native species. It was just really rewarding. And so that kind of got me hooked. And so then uh, obviously COVID sort of uh, dampened that and, and I didn't go out West doing uh doing it going on any upland hunts but this year I, i'm going to regroup i'm definitely uh going to get out there a couple times the plan is to go to north dakota chase sharp tails for a bit and then uh, i hope to go to idaho and chase uh chucker and uh, hungarian partridge and quail in idaho so i'm really looking forward to seeing that I, i'm kind of hoping to see some new ground every year from here on out and uh you know life's short let's uh i want to go exploring well you know i, I on that comment uh my my buddy uh, is a big trout fisherman, and, and uh, um, he, he's a little older than me, and he's uh, well-read, we'll put it that way. He, he, he's of that generation that literally re- reads a book to go to bed, and I, I, I'm just younger. I Damn TV got involved, and I don't read as much as I would like to. But he used to read a bunch of John Garrett's books, and he always used to tell me every time I told him I had, had to go to work instead of um, go trout fishing that day, he says, life's short and responsibilities are overrated. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of, I kind of look at it a little bit differently now, but I, I, I my, my saying is, is life's short and, and bird hunting season's even shorter. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> you have to take advantage Amen. of it. Yeah. And, and I don't know, that's why I love wing shooting so much. And, and I like, like, you know, your story, I, I got into it a lot with, with, more with dogs. I was a deer hunter prior to really getting the dog. And that was my main focus in the fall and it's completely shifted. But when I started traveling to wing shoot, um, and, and you, you know, you, you just tend to do it being a bird hunter. Um, you know, you, you I, I can't, I got to drive at least an hour to really get into some decent cover by me. And that, that's not anything in comparison to up by you where you might be able to get out your back door, but you know, we did wing shooters tend to travel a little bit. So it, it's, it's kind of that element of exploring for me and, and the adventure of seeking new covers. And that, uh, always seems to be getting me excited to go back out and get the dogs out. So, um, you'll Absolutely. have to let me know how Idaho goes. It's, it's definitely on my list of places to check out. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And just with social media, it, you know, you just can get, it's just a real good upland community out there. I've, I found and just there, everyone's been so friendly and open to like, Hey, you know, come here and come visit there. And so I'm really just part of this trip is sort of just meeting new folks through social media and just going out and, you know, people come on off. I'll show you the ropes. So I'm, it, it, it'll be fun to meet new people, see new ground and hunt behind different dogs. You know, I, as I get older, I, you know, I can keep my dog in the crate and, uh, rest them and go hunt behind a different breed, a different style. It's, it's just, it's fun to sort of have an open mind and, and, and get, get after it. I, I, I much agree. So, um, well, I, I really personally don't have anything else to cover today. So I, I just wanted to, you know, kind of give you the opportunity to, you know, if there's anything else you'd like to say in closing. Uh, I think we covered a lot of good ground here. I appreciate uh, the time you took and the detail. I think there's a lot of good things happening for Upland game in Wisconsin and uh, Sharp Tail specifically. And I think there's going to be the future looks, you know, good and we're, it's going to be challenging, but I think we, uh, we got good momentum, good passion, good energy. And I appreciate you uh, taking the time and uh, asking the questions and shining some light on the issues. 
I, I, I've been given a lot of opportunities in my life and I can't, I can't thank you guys enough for just being open and welcoming so that I can do what I feel like I, I, I want to do with this. And, and it's, uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, so I hope some of the listeners can, you know, be inspired by some of our passions for this. And, uh, um, it's one of those things that I'm just excited to help. Yeah. Well, there's plenty of opportunity to do it and you're sort of creating this space. So I, I think this is keep up the good work. Awesome. Mike, well, you might hear a little music here as we roll out, but, um, you know, that's, that's all I have for today. So thank you so much for being on the amazing outdoors podcast. Uh, yeah, it's been my pleasure, Brian. Thanks.